Mr. Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining us on ITV Gold yet again. I think it's so important for us to have a political voice, a voice to just make us understand what's happening in the government, in the country right now. Um, thank you again for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. And thank you for having me back on your show. Appreciate it very much. Of course. You know, I have to start this interview asking you a really important question. Today, a giant Senate uh, hearing was held, um, you know, featuring top healthcare officials um, of the nation, discussing a lot of facts on the coronavirus pandemic, its impact. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci actually warning against early reopening of certain states. Um, how should we as an audience watching this sort of understand what happened today and its importance in our everyday life? Yeah, I think the, the thing we should do as an audience, as you put it, is to uh, take the advice of the medical experts. They know what's going on with this virus. Dr. Anthony Fauci, of course, is the leading world expert on viruses, on uh, epidemiology. He's an epidemiologist. He's a, an infectious diseases specialist. Right. And therefore, he knows where uh, we should be going with this. The warnings were stark and uh, plain for all of us to see. Uh, if you try to open too quickly, reopen too quickly, we are headed right back to square one and probably even further back. In other words, we could see a resurgence that we wouldn't want to see, that we'd want to get rid of in the first place, and instead see a resurgence that will be extremely difficult to tame as we get into the future. So his warnings were blunt. Uh, so were the, uh, the testimony from the CDC chief and the FDA chief, all of them very forthright, very uh, honest and uh, laying it uh, right out there and telling all of us and telling the world, we better watch this very carefully. Uh, Dr. Fauci made a very interesting point about how right. insidious this particular virus is. You think you've gotten ahead of it and then it springs a surprise on you. And, and uh, that was something that was very scary in a sense, but also the stark reality for all of us to sort of fathom. Definitely. And in terms of the leadership that you saw today, of uh, the Republican senators and uh, the Democrats, what did you have to say about the way they handled coronavirus and the way they, you know, asked their questions? Do you think a lot of uh, them were valid? A lot of them made sense to you? Yeah, a lot of them made sense to me. There would be, there, there's, there was the underlying tone, but I, I call it deliberately underlying tone of uh, partisanship. But on the, uh, you know, overall, on the, you know, in the overall picture, I right. think they were all very, very concerned about their own uh, uh, futures. As you can see, so many of them were reporting from their homes, their home offices and all the rest of it. They were uh, testifying from there. And this whole testimony took place uh, remotely, virtually. Right. And uh, you could see there was a lot of concern. So I think nobody wants to play politics here. I think everybody just wants to know the truth, where we stand. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is, that the people of the United States, the people of the world, do want to see a reopening of sorts. Right. I think people are uh, getting impatient now. They're very scared, but they're also impatient, and they want to see that things will start to at least get back to some semblance of normalcy. So we, that's, that's my response, yeah. Are we ready for reopening in terms of uh, the economic need? According to you, you know, we are in recession already. This is the hardest it's hit the country over a decade now um, in terms of the economic crisis. What's your take on reopening and, and the economy? Do you actually see it uh, lift up from there? Yeah, I don't think anybody is ready for opening as such. I think even if they reopen, they're gonna have very strict uh, guidelines, you know, as to how we reopen partially and then, you know, bit by bit by bit and all the rest of it. And I think even if they do reopen, for instance, if they open up the restaurants and mm -hmm. say, okay, you can start patronizing restaurants, but uh, you're going to be sitting 10 feet apart from, say, the other guests who's going to be there. And that type of thing gets put into effect. I think a lot of people are still going to uh, walk with trepidation, be uh, much, uh, much, much overly cautious. They'll be afraid. I would be afraid to go into a public place myself. Um, so I think uh, in any case, it's going to take a while. When we talk about reopening, you're talking about the initial steps. You talk about reopening the economy. Again, you're talking about the, uh, you know, the, the initial steps. Nobody knows what's going to happen because nobody's ever been through this situation before, at least for more than 100 years. And so this is going to be a test for everyone. And I think uh, there's no one, no one in their right minds will make a, a definitive prediction about what's going to happen to the economy and so on and so forth. I can say, though, that right. if we get to some sort of normalcy, uh, a couple of years down the line is what we're looking at, maybe three years or so. Yeah. Oh, wow.
You know, I want to understand um, the government and politics um, with the COVID-19 situation here right now, especially for our viewers. I think we can all gain some more perspective on it. Um, the roles and responsibility of state and local governments have increased massively um, in the last couple of months. Um, what do you have to say in that regards and how much of uh, this lies on them when the reopening is happening to ensure that public safety is considered uh, you know, as an utmost responsibility of all? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good question. I think I answered uh, some of it in your last uh, segment when we talked about this issue. Uh, there's a difference between the federal government and the states. The states have their own autonomous uh, methods of governing, their own uh, freedom of choice in how they govern each of the states. And that's why President Trump repeatedly uh, drew reporters' attention to that fact that he did not want to intrude upon states. What the federal government uh, can do is issue general national guidelines of where things should head. Now he leaves it then, the, the president or whoever's in power, leaves it up to the states, the federal government, in other words, leaves it up to the states to decide what they do. Each governor uh, will, will hopefully be prudent in looking at their own economic situations, their own uh, health tallies, their own uh, you know, numbers of who, how many COVID-19 victims, patients there are, and where they should go from here uh, here on forth. For instance, so many Northeastern states, as you know, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, uh, Massachusetts, many of them have teamed up all along the uh, Eastern seaboard uh, to do a coordinated response to reopening. In other words, they will all do so in phases, coordinating with each other. So they have councils, they have advisors that were set up since the last time we spoke on this show. Uh, they've set up uh, commissions and they've set up councils who will advise the commission. And those councils uh, will look into various aspects of the economy that should be opening up. For yes, instance, please. hospitality. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, just uh, in terms of uh, just discussing more on the state, when we had Governor Phil Murphy um, on ITV Goals with us, he basically asked and said that, you know, the, gov the, the government has asked, the state government has asked about $20 billion dollars a worth of funding from the federal government. And now the responsibility lies on uh, the federal government to provide these funds for these states. Today, um, you know, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, said that he needs $61 billion for New York uh, State uh, to recover from COVID. Could you explain how all of this is going to play with the role of state and the federal government involved? Yeah, there are a couple of things that happens in situations like this. The states can ask uh, the federal government for a loan or they can ask for an outright bailout, which they're doing under the CARES Act. That's part of what's happening. Uh, Congress had to pass that, uh, that act. And that also includes uh, aid for uh, you know, state governments, because after all, the states have lost uh, of, you know, an important stream of revenue, which is taxes, um, you know, coming in from businesses, which they have shut down. And now there are no more tax revenues coming in. So how do the states run? How do the local uh, you know, county governments run? How do the township uh, governments run? How do they, how does anything happen? How does sanitation happen? How do the police forces get paid? Stuff like that. So yeah, all the states, I'm sure, uh, have made appeals to the government to bail them out at this point. They do have the option of asking for loans. California was the first state. In fact, in fact, this past week, if I'm correct, California became the first state in the United States to ask for a loan from the federal government. And that's to bail out specifically its unemployment insurance uh, program, because so many people have applied for unemployment insurance there that they don't know if it will be able to last. So they've asked the government for a loan over there. Now that means that it has to be paid back. And what's that going to do? Eventually that's going to mean more taxes because how do you collect more revenue to pay back the federal government? Yeah. Uh, I think what Murphy is doing, in fact, I got to compliment uh, uh, Phil Murphy in that he has seemed to have established this rapport with the federal government, specifically with President Donald Trump, where he's getting some of what he needs. And that's the way to deal with the federal government when you're looking at the interests of your state, is to be able to deal with the federal government, no matter who's in power there, which party it is. If you can have that rapport, then you're, in a, you're certainly on a better wicket than others are. But I think what's going to happen is, in the end, there will have to be some more measures passed by Congress. Uh, states will definitely, defend, depending on which ones we're talking about, because some have been seriously affected, some are not that seriously affected. So the most seriously, seriously affected ones, uh, including New York, New Jersey, um, and some of the states along the Eastern seaboard, Louisiana, uh, would probably have to have a bailout in order to get through this thing. 
Do you think the communication between state and federal government, and I think I asked you that last time as well, do you think the communication is still going on strong? And the leadership that's, you know, um, at the Capitol right now in Washington, D.C., do you think they're doing their job efficiently? I think so, given the circumstances. Um, that, like I said, there's been partisanship, but I think they're beginning to come together now a bit more than uh, the past few weeks and since the last time I appeared on this show. I think they're beginning to see things and come together because there's no way uh, um, any of us are going to win this battle against uh, COVID-19 unless we all fight together. There's, there's absolutely no denying uh, that fact. I think the communication specifically is okay so far. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a problem with Andrew Cuomo of New York picking up the phone and calling uh, either the president or the vice president or anyone else who's key on that task force up there uh, and talking to them, I'm sure they'll all respond to him right away. The mm -hmm. same for New Jersey, same for Maryland, same for uh, Virginia, the same for uh, going down to uh, North and South Carolina, uh, you know, and, and Florida and so on and so forth. I think all the states are having, uh, you know, have open communication with the federal government. California, another example, even the state of Washington, uh, Illinois, uh, Ohio, you name them. I think they're all having, uh, there's no problem. But, but for the federal government too, it becomes, uh, you know, something that they have to start thinking about. After all, when you think of the Federal Reserve, for instance, you think that there's unlimited reserves of dollars. That's not really true. It's uh, theoretically true. They could just print uh, money, but, but in a real sense, no, because there's accountability of what happens to that money now and who's going to pay back that money. So the federal government, too, uh, will at some point come under huge economic strain. And that's when... Uh, we're going to have to really watch how the states and the federal government play out things together. You know, another issue that I want to highlight here is, again, the healthcare crisis that is facing the nation. Not only are we talking about still hospitals with capacity in New York State or New York City, we're talking about, you know, reopening which, you know, is causing a concern of a research of these COVID-19 cases. At the same time, this entire situation um, has brought up uh, the disparity in healthcare system in this country. Where do you see it, uh, you know, go from now on for the next couple of weeks? What are some key elements that you as a political commentator would be sort of observing uh, in terms of healthcare crisis? Okay, healthcare, good question. And I, here's something that we have to really be careful about is guess who's going to be under tremendous financial pressure? as a result of this and they are right now the hospitals mm. the big hospitals all the huge big names you're thinking about many of them could be in danger of financial ruin you know why because they've been treating covid 19 patients there's no revenue over there apparently as, as far as we know mm. uh, all these patients are coming in with or without insurance they must be treated under the law because this is a pandemic you can't turn anybody away they're using up hospital space uh, so elective surgeries, which is where hospitals make most of their money and their profit, have been zero. No, no surgeries for the past 10 weeks. And you know what that means. That's a huge loss in revenue for the hospitals. In fact, in some parts of the country, uh, medical personnel, including doctors who work with hospitals, including nurses, mm -hmm. hospital staff who do other things like, you know, keep the place clean, sanitized, all the rest of it, and many others, have been laid off. They've been furloughed at hospitals of all places. Now that's something even I didn't think would happen uh, until this pandemic came along. So we can see a huge uh, change in the medical system altogether if some of these hospitals fail, which is a real danger now coming up. If they fail, we have an even bigger problem with our healthcare system. Definitely. And another topic that I also want to highlight on while we have you here is uh, the education system, um, especially with looking at the fact that pretty much everything in the nation right now has gone remote um, in terms of learning. Most schools are finishing their academic year uh, via remote learning, and some are still trying to figure out what to do about the summer or fall session. Where do you see our education system go for the rest of the year, rest of 2020? And um, what can you tell us about the impact? COVID has had on the entire education system. Well, you know, I mean, can you imagine how many graduations have not taken place this year? Yes. They've all just taken place virtually. You yourself uh, were a graduate a few years ago of college. I was many years ago. And uh, it, it's the most important time in one's life to graduate from school, from college. And uh, those haven't happened. Virtual learning is great uh, to a degree. But I mean, the whole purpose of having institutions of learning such as 
uh, schools, such as colleges, is the social interaction which all of us as humans need for proper development, for proper intellectual stimulation, right. for proper challenges to your personality and all the rest of it, so you shape up into a better human being. We can carry on with this through the end of the year. I'm already writing off uh, traditional classes as we've known it uh, through the end of this year. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm entirely wrong because I hope a vaccine or something like that comes along really quick, mm -hmm. but I don't think I'm wrong. We have to write that off completely which is a pity. Um, and so it's going to be virtual education, which is not the best. It really is not going to be the best type of education because you do need a professor who's standing right there, looking at the class, challenging them, asking them uh, probing questions and uh, prompting the student to give an answer. It's very, very important. That type of learning process is extremely important. So remote learning is great. It's a good substitute for an emergency. It's a good substitute if you want to work, you know, do summer classes, that type of thing. It's great. But I think uh, it's not a substitute for traditional teaching, traditional learning. This year, write it off. Uh, we're not going to see uh, going back to classes anytime. No way. If we do, they're going to be vastly reduced uh, class numbers, which means staggering them over several weeks. No holidays, that type of thing. Because you'll have a class of, say, 30 broken up into three sessions of 10 each. And then that's going to drag into time. So it's, it's not a good scene for the education uh, picture at all. But it'll all come around in another couple of years, I think. Do you think they're able to educate? And I say it very fairly asking this question. Do you think they're able to educate every child in this country right now? And I'm talking mainly about the public school system here right now. We're hearing about a lot of disparities, children not having laptops or internet to access. Um, your comments on that? Yeah, no, you can't get education to every uh, child out there right now under these circumstances, no. As you rightly pointed out, there are, uh, first of all, getting the laptops, laptops out doesn't mean anything if they don't have any internet connections. There are many families that do not have internet connections simply because they cannot afford to have one. Uh, you know, the, the costs of cable, the costs of internet uh, are not as cheap as everybody might assume. And so there are a lot of families who simply are worried about putting food on the table uh, can't worry about an internet connection. And so those families do not have a connection and therefore the laptop is no good for virtual learning. Right. So um, I don't mean to sound, uh, you know, we have painted a dismal picture, but there are realities in life in, in society here in the United States as well. Um, in rural America, you're not going to be able to, the, the kid over there is going to have a, a greater disadvantage of learning uh, virtually because some areas may not even have a proper internet connection, even if they have internet connections. It might be sporadic. You'll get dropped signals. Um, so it's a mammoth task, first of all, getting a, a laptop into, the, uh, into every household that has a child that should have one. It's going to be a mammoth proposition. Again, it involves money. It involves contributions. Yeah. It involves um, getting that many laptops made for a population of 330 million plus people. And, 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 you know, and to make sure everyone has one. So just, just it's, it's an enormous task at hand. And I don't know how uh, they can really do it. I think the solution to all of this is going to be just what everyone is doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just going to talk about for a minute about uh, the potential vaccine. First of all, vaccine, there's no guarantee there will even be a vaccine. But I just listened to the World Health Organization chief the other day addressing uh, reporters. That was about three days before this interview was being taped. Mm -hmm. And he talked about 400 scientists, top scientists around the world, are working very closely in coordination with each other. And he expressed optimism that there was an accelerated process to develop a vaccine underway. Dr. Fauci has been saying something very similar, that there is a process underway. Nobody knows for sure if it'll happen, but that's the only way. If a vaccine does emerge and one that's effective, has no side effects, is not dangerous, proven to be safe for everyone, then the next stage is to get those vaccines out to the entire world population, which is 7 billion plus people. Right. Make sure everyone is inoculated. And then you need a cert. I, I'm predicting something else. We're going to be carrying health certificates for a long time to come, just right. like we carry our driver's license. Mm -hmm. Because now you're going to have to prove before you walk into a public space, even a restaurant, right. that you have a vaccine. You, you are you know, protected against this virus, and you're not going to come in here and spread it to someone else. So I'm predicting the health certificate, which used to be commonplace in travel in the 50s and the 60s, by the way, Mm -hmm. We'll make a comeback, and that's going to be for our daily lives. And that's the only way 
I'm going to see, I think we're going to see some sort of normalcy coming back to all of us. Wow, that was a very interesting point. I am going to look forward to, you know, that being, uh, you know, being done here. I think it'll be really interesting for us to all get a vaccination, which is required. And I hope that happens very soon. I still have a few more questions left before we right. end the interview. Another topic that I really want to reflect upon was, and this is something that we discussed with Attorney General Gurbi Garibal and um, um, Governor Phil Murphy, which was this uh, this rise in violence and domestic violence as well as crime and, and hate crime, um, all of those four categories we have, we're seeing in the last couple of weeks. Your comments on that and you know why is there such a rise in all of this violence suddenly while we're in this pandemic? Yeah, pent up frustration is the one sentence answer to your question, which is again a very good question. Yes, uh, domestic violence has been a huge rise and, and it's a particular problem right now. Uh, there are many, many um, people out there who are victims of abuse. It's of serious concern to authorities. I can, I can tell you from my own uh, leaning through information, I find a lot of law enforcement efforts are busy with this, this particular problem. They're being called into houses, to homes. Uh, many organizations are being called to rescue uh, women and children who are the subject of abuse, uh, domestic abuse. It's happening in every community, by the way, not just one particular community, but every community, by the way. And it's a huge problem. Um, this type of isolation, this type of uh, keeping indoors uh, can really affect one's mental stability, especially when one is not mentally stable. Uh, if you've had issues, if people have been, are being treated for mental uh, issues, they're likely to have explosive episodes during this period at this time. And the one they're likely to take off uh, on are the ones closest to them or nearest to them. And that's why this rise in domestic violence in my, in my view. Now, um, the xenophobia, the racism, mm -hmm. et cetera, that you're talking about, and I'm sure the Attorney General of uh, New Jersey must have addressed this mm -hmm. with you. Yeah, that's another problem. That again is an issue when this, this, this virus, for instance, there are a lot of people who want to blame it on somebody, right? Right. So you either blame it on the government or you blame it on uh, on somebody out there who you think is spread it or you blame it on a foreign power or you blame it on a foreigner. OK, or that or you blame it on a person who looks foreign. something like that. Somebody you want you want to look for an outlet just to blame someone. And I see the, the rise in xenophobia, racism, etc. Right. is a direct result of this, where they are looking to blame someone. And when you're looking to blame someone. You don't care who it is, you're going to attack. Once you, if you see someone that you think, ah, I can blame them and get away with it, mm -hmm. they'll do it. Again, it's a psychological problem more than anything else, but a very serious one because this can lead to a huge discord in societies. And like I said at the outset, the first thing we need to do is all come together and fight this problem together. It's a problem of humanity, not of a particular race or a particular country or a particular region. Definitely. Mr. Vyas, when we look at so many issues that are sort of evolving right now, in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, from economic crisis to healthcare crisis, uh, to this issue of domestic violence, to education, to so much happening on the local levels, on the state levels, uh, for the next couple of weeks, what do you think we should all focus on? And as a political commentator, what are you going to be observing um, in the next couple of weeks, especially? Yeah, as a political commentator, to answer the last one first, um, I, I, um, I'd like to see all the politicians, you know, really get along together now at this point. There's no point trying to, uh, you know, point the finger at anybody. I've used the word point so many times there in that sentence, but, you know, I, I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> Is that uh, they should not be pointing fingers at each other, but all get together as quickly as they can, because we have, we have to be unified in fighting this uh, virus. At the same time, uh, here in this country, we have important elections coming up, the presidential election in November. Yes. I think it is going to have to be without a doubt um, carried out uh, via mail. And I don't think it behooves anyone to even suggest that there will be fraud uh, in either case. I'm sure we have enough competent uh, officials around the country right. who can ascertain that uh, we have a free and fair election even by via mail ballot. That'll be the safest way to do it in my opinion. And uh, we can have an orderly election, an orderly transition of power, whoever it may be, the current incumbent or, uh, or whoever else is uh, elected by the people of the United States. On that front, I think uh, no problem. There should be no problem between politicians at all. They should, in fact, come together. 
As to what we should do over the next couple of weeks, I think we need to very carefully listen to guidance, listen to guidance from the federal government, listen to guidance from our local leaders, namely the governor, the attorney general, for instance, uh, in each state as well, in terms of law enforcement and rules that would be laid out and what could be a violation of the law. It's very important to note here, the people of the United States, particularly in any democracy around the world, treasure and value their freedom. So they don't, they don't really want to be told, stay home. That's, that's the issue. That's another big issue that's emerging now in all of this. People don't want to be told, you stay home and you do what we tell you. No. What you do is suggest to them, that, look, health officials say this is what we need to do. We request you as people of our state, as people of the country, please follow these guidelines for your good and for the good of your neighbors, your friends, and your family. If we can all do that, the next two to four weeks will be good. Reopening is taking place now. It will take place. And that's because it's out of necessity, number one. People are tired. They do want to start getting out there, starting to try to get some semblance of normalcy and get the economy back. So do the government uh, leaders. But I think we all need to be uh, tread very carefully, go uh, very, very, go step by step, check each step. And if we have to walk back a couple of steps, do so. So uh, generally caution is the rule is what I'd say. Definitely. Well, thank you for your time here on ITV Go, Mr. Vyas. We again really appreciate it. Your one last message to our audience and um, maybe um, a tip you can give them as somebody who's really learned in all these topics. Well, uh, the tip uh, to all your viewers is pretty simple. Stay happy. Mm -hmm. Do not let this get you down. Uh, stay in a positive mood if something depresses you, uh, upsets you. And if you spot some sunlight outside your window, go ahead, look at that sunshine and enjoy it. Be grateful. I think each one of us should be grateful that we are here. We're alive. We're able to experience life itself. Just mm -hmm. think about it. I'm not trying to meditate or tell anybody to meditate or pray or anything like that, but think about it. We have lost so many fellow human beings to this nasty, dangerous virus. If you're up and you're alive and you're able to talk and you've seen someone survive this, you, they are all very lucky. Just be thankful. Thankful to whoever you believe in, even in yourself, that you're around. Be grateful. Share that love and happiness with everybody else. And I can assure you, we're going to have a great future coming up very, very soon. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Aditi.